Emmy, I think, asked me to do this because you must have been fielding questions about PATH. Is that why? Yeah. Um, and um, I've been um, not only at Hearts and Horses for however long, since 2013, um, but I kind of got recruited by PATH to do a lot of things. So um, Emmy asked me uh, if I could kind of just answer questions or um, kind of put put it out there what path is. So I do want this to be completely interactive. So ask questions as you think of them. You don't need to wait till the end. Um, and then I will do my best to answer them. Um, and we'll just kind of go through it. I kind of did it with a little bit of history of path and uh, you know how to become a member if you're not already. Are any of you guys already members of path? No, I didn't know we could be. Oh yeah, see, there right. you go. That's great. I didn't yeah, and yes, Brittany, um, Emmy has the slides, so she is more, more than welcome to send those out to you guys if you would like to have them. Um, and Emmy, if you want to send them out with my notes, um, we can because that gives more explanations. Um, Thank you. And, and the awesome. purpose to join PATH would be? Say that again? The reason why we might want to join PATH would be what? Yeah, so um, we'll get to that on the membership um, side, but there are um, benefits. You, there's a magazine that comes out every month that has a lot of great information, and it's usually themed. Actually, I got mine in the mail yesterday. Um, so they have some great articles, and the articles are written by um, PATH members. So uh, a lot of the instructors that you know and work with have written articles and contributed to it. Um, it's got great information. Um, discounts on um, webinars that they have, um, and you're supporting, um, you know, the organization. So, you know, kind of like that. And again, I apologize for my cat. Oh, it's getting no, louder by the minute. I love cats. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. He's all the way downstairs. He's just oh, got a good voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you want to go to the next? Um, or do you have control? You have control of the slides, right? No. Is that the second slide? Oh, there's the second slide. Thank you. Um, so PATH used to be called, um, when it first started, it started in 1969. So it's been around a while, but it used to be called the North American Writing for the Handicapped Association. Um, and that was their logo, which is similar to the PATH logo. There were about 20 people. They met in Virginia. Um, and the impetus for that was the Olympics that had happened. And there was a gentleman um, that um, was uh, handicapped and he won a silver medal. And it kind of just showed that, look, people that have disabilities can still ride horses, can still compete, can still do things. Um, and those people uh, got together um, some of them are still involved today, um, we call them our, our, our founding mothers, um, and um, it, it really, um, they, they wanted to do something in North America. So uh, Canada has an organization, and um, then NARA started, um, and it's obviously grown. So it was the 1952 Olympics, I think. So um i'm reading sorry um yep they started it in virginia and then in i want to say 2008 2009 discussion kind of it wasn't pc to say handicapped anymore so they kind of looked at it and they also had interests outside of the united states so they wanted to become more modern more inclusive and so they got together, and I believe it was 2010 or 2000, I think 2010, they changed their name to PATH, so Professional Association of Therapeutic Horsemanship um, International. Um, and even now, um, I'm part of a group that is discussing, we've been together for two years. Um, it's not just PATH, but it's um, other um, equine organizations about uh, language and about terminology 
Um, so the word therapeutic is now in question because um, the lay person, a lot of times, um, if you say something is therapeutic or even, you know, then therapy, how many times have you guys heard like, oh, I want to do equine therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and we're like, no, you know, are you doing therapy on the horse? Are you, you know, and so it gets com convoluted. And then people, therapists get really upset if it's, um, you know, they're the only ones that are able to do therapy because they're licensed to do so. And also, um, it's, it's, it's just difficult to differentiate between the word therapy and therapeutic, even though we who are involved in it understand the difference. Um, Wasn't you know, the phrase there. I heard most recently that we say equine assisted therapeutic activities? Did I get that right? Um, yeah, equine assisted activities and therapies. Activities and therapies. Yeah, so you'll see here the acronym EAAT, and that's another one that people are, some people want it and some people don't. Again, if you use it properly, it's fine. But the, the therapists are the ones that have a lot hard time. Um, and that has to do a lot with billing. Um, they, if anything that has equine in it, they can get refused payment they have to bill as whatever their therapy is. So occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, art therapy, whatever it is, um, even mental health. And uh, now um, you really have to bill per your therapy and kind of leave the equine out. Otherwise it gives the insurance companies an easy out to say, nope, you're doing horseback riding. That's not therapy. How about so, um, yeah. therapy? Do they accept that? Who? Hippotherapy. So hippotherapy, it's a very interesting dynamic and we won't get too deep into it, but um, hippotherapy is a no. Hippotherapy um, started, that word started in Germany um, and American, you know, we adopted it in the American Hippotherapy Association kind of um, put their foot in their mouth, if you will, um, because we're trying to move away from the word hippotherapy because it's a misnomer, right? It's, it's essentially saying equine therapy in Greek. Um, and so uh, it, we're moving away from that. And it's essentially, you know, occupational therapy incorporating equines, you know, and so you're putting the therapy first um, wow. instead of the, that. So uh, obviously um, AHA would need to change their name. <laughs> and there's a there's a cost involved in that. That's about eighty thousand dollars at least to do rebranding, um, and then you got you know. So it's really a hard thing to um, change a name. So when Path did, I mean that took a lot of effort to change their name and then get that out there. And you'll still hear people, old, older people, say Nara, you know, and you're like, no, no, no. Um, now it's North American Reining Horse Association. So NARA has been taken over by someone else. And so <laughs> you could, if you look it up, you, you'll get reining instead of a uh, path. So anyway, that's kind of the history of how path got started. Um, and I found it really interesting when they, you know, when they did the name change, um, it was more, they just wanted to, um, incorporate international growth, get rid of the word handicapped because it, they said it was outdated and, um, and you know, kind of have it of the professional association, give it a more professional edge. All right, next slide. So this is how PATH is organized. There's regions. So there's 11 regions. Um, even though the regions are labeled like this, um, region 11, region one, region two have some of our um, international uh, countries in, incorporated in, into them. Um, we are region 10 and each region has a region rep. So um, PATH International Headquarters, for those of you that didn't know, it is located in Denver. So it's nice and close. It's actually um, in Westminster, but Denver. Um, and um, it, it's a small staff that's there. Um, but each region uh, rep um, is our point of contact. And then each region every year has a conference. And you're, if you're a member, you can go to the conference. You can, um, it's in a different 
uh, state of our region every year. They kind of change around. Um, very interesting information. Sometimes it's easier for people to go to their region conference than it is their, the international conference or the big, huge conference. Um, PATH tries to do it east coast, then they'll, they'll do the middle of the, of the country, then they'll do the west coast. So every year they're kind of switch it around. So some people can't go every year, they'll go to the one that's closest to them. Last year we were lucky to have it in Denver. Um, this year they're going to have um, it uh, virtual, I believe, um, for obvious reasons. So um, you can sign up to to go to those. That's another, you get a discount if you're a member to go to the international conference. They're usually about four days. It's full of um, lectures uh, from all different uh, people on different subjects. They have hands-on stuff that you can go do and work with the horses and someone will do demonstrations and things like that. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a really great networking um, activity and you get to know people. Sometimes that's the only time you get to see people like any conference, you know, every year. It's really neat to um, see each other again and that type of thing. Um, if you go to the next slide, it'll kind of lay out where the regions are so you can see what states are in what region. Um, well, region four has Ontario, so um, I'm not going to read all of these to you, but you can see, you know, a lot of um, Canada and things like that are region one. Region two has Europe in the Middle East. Um, and region 10 is us, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. Um, we have, uh, I would say Asia um, has a lot of um, path has, you know, they've been really active with path centers in Korea and um, things like that. So it's really neat to see um, that they, you know, have path centers all over the place. Mm -hmm. Hi guys. Hi Ruth. Good. Sorry, we didn't get it. No worries, I'm just on a Zoom. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, we can go to the next. Do you have any question about the regions or anything like that? Oh, no, I'm on that. I'm talking. Go ahead. Next, next slide. You have. Okay, great. So we, you can, another question Emmy probably gets a lot is about certifications. How do you become a PATH instructor? Um, that could be its own webinar. Um, but if you look on the website, um, then um, under education tab, you click on certifications. And then this is the list of types of certifications they have. And if you're interested, you can click on, um, on that when you go to the website. And I don't know if you can do that, I mean, from here, if you can click on the link, but if that'll mess things up. Brittany has it. Um, if you look on that, it. Oh, you're going away. Oh, thanks, Brittany. <laughs> there it is. So if you scroll down, you can see there's education certifications. There you are. Um, if you click on any of the um, things that right now, CTRI is the new one. So. Um, it, They've moved to a certified um, therapeutic riding instructor instead of just a therapeutic riding instructor. Um, what they tried to do is um, have an outside source do our certifications instead of PATH doing it. And that's supposed to give PATH a little more and, and the certification more credibility to have an outside source. Kind of like when you go to a school, you get a degree in counseling, but you have to go to a national board to get your your pass a test and then your board credentialed to be a counselor. Um, it's why there's one law exam, right? You go to law school, you don't, the law school doesn't say you're a lawyer. You go take the exam, you pass that, now you're a lawyer, right? Those are the type thing. So for the CTRI, there's an outside source now that does the certifications, not PATH. Um, that will, they're trying to see how that works and then, um, They'll, all the other certifications will probably follow suit. Um, so that all certifications, 
And what I mean by that is the CTRI, the advanced, the master, the driving, and the vaulting will be certified out by an outside source. Um, and again, they wanted to do that for a couple reasons. One is um, to give more credibility, um, so it's not internal, um, and to make it so that the therapeutic writing instructor has a little more oomph to it um, because it is an actual credential thing. And eventually in the future to be able to get paid more um, because you are, you know, certified um, instructor. So any questions about that? All the things you see on your computer that should be purple, um, those are links that you can go to um, to uh, get the information that it says. So there's booklets. Um, for CTRI um, that you can go to to kind of see what is the process if you're interested. It's a commitment. Um, Hearts and Horses does do instructors and training. Um, even though you're doing CTRI, um, there is a requirement to do teaching hours. Um, and the way Hearts and Horses does is it is we do require that you do volunteer with us and um, for at least six months and then um, you know be volunteering while you're um, doing your instructor and training. Um, there is a contract that you would sign, you would get a mentor, um, which is one of the instructors that already is an instructor. Um, hopefully they've done the mentoring course, which is another course you can do. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can become a mentor. I'm sure, have all of you heard of equine specialist in mental health and learning, or we call it mm -hmm. ESHMAL. Um, that one is, uh, you do not have to be a therapeutic writing instructor to attend that course. You do need to be a PATH member. So for those of you that do a lot of work with um, changing leads classes or with my veterans class, so equine facilitated learning, um, those type classes, the more on the mental health, social, emotional learning that um, may be interested in the equine specialist in mental health and learning certification. Um, and again, you do not need to be a PATH instructor to attend that. We get people that are in the mental health, people that are going to work with PATH instructors, you know, um, as equine specialist. So essentially an equine specialist helps the mental health provider um, interpret what the horse is doing. So you're, you're the horse person, essentially, um, in the mental health thing, kind of just being the horse's advocate and also interpreting what the horse is doing. The mental health person is obviously focused on the person and you're focusing on what the horse's reaction to that person is. So it's kind of a fun course. Um, I believe we are holding a certification in October um, and we usually do it every year, usually in the fall. Um, it's four days. Um, Arts and Horses always puts on a really good um, workshop. So if you're interested, um, you can ask Emmy or Kelly or um, Lauren about that. Um, I think, is this one full? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. I know we have a, a cohort already, but I don't know if it's registration closed or not. Okay. Marilyn, did you have a question? I did. Um, would that be something that would be helpful for me in my role with you? Um, it's, it's really good. Yeah. I mean, I feel like anyone that works with the changing leads kiddos or you work with the school groups with Tamara or you um, are going to be working with the veterans group at all. Anything that has to do with kind of the mental health, like I said, the social emotional stuff more than the therapeutic writing, even though it's always helpful. But this is it, it's helpful um, when working with those because there is a lot, there's trauma, there's emotion, there's, you know, things like that. And really helping um, notice things with the horse, how the horses react to that, how they take that in and helping your rider interpret that, you know, why did that horse doesn't like me? Well, okay, what did that horse do? Well, he put his ears back. Well, was he putting his ears back at you or was he putting his ears back at the horse that walked by? I'm thinking of Mac Max. Or like what Bo was doing last week. Always. Yeah. Like, is that the horse, you know, is the horse, the horse is talking, that's how they talk with their body and interpret, helping the, the rider interpret that, you know, what is, what is the horse saying and what, and how, if you don't like what they're saying, perhaps what can you do 
to change that conversation? How, how are you reacting to the horse that makes the horse um, react in that way? So um, yeah, it's, a, it's really an interesting course. So you can kind of go through here and look and see, read the booklets, you know, read the criteria. You don't get certified right after the, um, the course. You have to put together a portfolio um, that um, they lay out what you need in that portfolio, and that can be, it's, it's a lifelong learning thing. So if you've, bless you, if you've taken um, courses in a college that had to do with psychology or mental health or, you know, social work or things like that, those count toward that. Does it count hours. if they were um, a few years ago? Yep, I did mine um, with, I got most of my hours when I got my master's in counseling. I'm like, oh yeah, because you need a total of 60 hours and it can be split between equine and mental health or it can be 60 of one of all mental health, it didn't matter. Um, and I was like, boom, there you go. <laughs> so um, you just do their, the portfolio. You have someone um, you know, sign off from parts and horses or from anywhere to say you know, your horse skills and things like that. But um, it'll lay it out there. It says criteria, I think, in their um, instructor criteria. You can click on that, and it'll tell you, you know, what what the process is and what you need to do. Okay. I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Oh yeah, great. I'm just wondering. Um, I'm curious to hear from your experience or anyone else's, I guess, too. Um, if you've come across a lot of licensed counselors with the ESMHL. And then if yeah. so, how they like maybe incorporate that or what that looks like yeah. in therapeutic riding or? Sure. So PATH um, is, is unique. I don't know if you've heard of EGALA. So oh, yeah, EGALA yeah. is, yeah. So EGALA is strictly ground and it's mm -hmm. mental health. Um, right. Their requirement is that you have a mental health provider and an ES, you can't dual hat. Um, okay. With PATH, you can. So okay. we do get a lot of mental, of mental health um, people who are generally health uh, horse people that want to get this certification too so that they can do themselves. Okay. So they have a better understanding of the horse. So um, PATH does not require it to be separate, um, okay. whereas EGALA does. So it's, okay. sometimes it's hard. I've tried it to be doing it all, if you will. Um, if you have, it, it's just easier to have two people because if you have to take your client away or something from the horse, oh, you yeah. have a horse here, <laughs> you're like, uh, sure. uh, so it is easier, but yes, it, if to answer your question, you can, um, mm -hmm. dual hat. And a lot of, again, the participants that we get that take the certification are mental health providers um, okay. that want to incorporate horses into their practice. So they want to get the horse side. Okay. And so are there any, um, for like the changing leads and um, veterans classes at Hearts and Horses, are there, um, I guess, who would it, are any of the instructors have this and like licensed professional counselors or are most of them this plus another like PATH certification? So um, all of our instructors are PATH CTRIs, so they're okay. certified instructors. They have to in order to be teaching there. So that's a requirement. Um, and most of us are all ESs as well because we all end up teaching CL classes eventually. Got it. Um, so I think almost every instructor is both. Um, we did that on purpose um, a couple of years ago. There were nine people that took the course all at <laughs> one time because there is a PATH standard that says if you are doing uh, equine facilitated learning, which is what uh, CL and um, the veterans program fall under, that you have mm -hmm. to have an ES in residence. So you have to have an ES around. So mm -hmm. we just did a blanket certification for everybody. So everyone has it so that there's no worry about um, who's teaching um, the mm -hmm. class. You know, you, yeah. we have ES experience. Sure. Makes um, sense. Yeah. Did that answer the question? Your question? I think so. There's just, I mean, there's a couple different unique opportunities. It sounds like for, um, and it, you're right. It is hard to differentiate between like therapeutic kind of activities versus like mental health therapy. You know, yeah. um, 
because I know there's Gestalt and then there's Egala and this one. And so it's just, it, it, yeah, it's helpful to try to differentiate. Between yeah, what's we, there's equine facilitated psychotherapy as well, EFP. And oh, the yeah, yeah. Between EFP and EFL, um, mm -hmm. equine facilitated psychotherapy is just that. It is actual therapy that you have to have a licensed therapist to mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. um, EFL is a kind of that gray area where it's equine facilitated learning. So you do not have to have a certified uh, counselor or therapist to do that. Um, EFP generally is more one on one. So it's kind of like the OT and the PT. Um, stuff. It's more one-on-one -on -one than group, whereas EFL is more group learning. Um, and it's learning, so the social-emotional side you can do, you know, as a group, whereas the EFP is more um, dealing with an issue or the trauma or whatever it is that that person is there to deal with, with a counselor and the horse. So those are the differences. So when you do EGALA, it's almost always on a one-on-one. -on -one. I don't work max two they don't really do yeah yeah okay. and same with the gestalt i think that is more one-on-one yeah, -on -one. yeah. Um, okay cool well thank you yeah you're welcome so i would just if you have time peruse the website there's a lot of stuff on there um you can get you know stuck down the rabbit hole like any website but um there's a lot of information um if you want to go back and me So again, those are the different certifications. Um, there's a huge leap between regular certified therapeutic riding instructor and advanced. It's kind of like going from an AA degree to a master's degree. It's, it's a big jump. Um, and so that's, it's a, it's difficult. Um, there are some of us that have tried <laughs> and it's, it's different than this, than the, you can kind of pick at it and piecemeal it and get it. Um, master's therapeutic writing instructor. It's more um, doing, you know, you write articles and it's kind of like your PhD um, there. Um, and then driving and vaulting, those are just special specialties. Um, you have to be a regular path instructor and then you can go and get your driving and vaulting um, if you want to. Um, Liz is a vaulting, and um, interactive vaulting instructor and she's also a certified vaulting instructor, which means she's like outside of path, regular vaulting instructor as well, vaulting coach. Um, but yeah, if you have interest in any of that, you can look through. Sometimes things can be confusing, so you can ask one of us um, if you need to interpret that. All right, we can go to the next one. So membership, so you can see there with the numbers, there's quite a few um, members. Um, and those are the, I think those numbers are 2018. So obviously it's probably more now or who knows with COVID. Um, there's, um, you know, like we talked about OTPT, there's mental health, there's driving, there's a lot of things that PATH does. Um, and they're doing more of the educational stuff and leadership, um, training, team building, things like that. I know Tamara wants to do more of that at, at Hearts and Horses, um, contacting um, corporations that want to do team building, things like that, activities. Um, we've done a couple. We actually did it with the PATH, PATH board. So the PATH board came and spent a day with us and did activities and stuff like that. Not all people think that all the board members are horsey people. They're not. Um, and even our own board has people that aren't horsey people on it. So. Um, it was a really neat opportunity for them to do some horse stuff for the day. Um, it was all, I think, groundwork and, um, you know, also visit a center. So we're kind of lucky in where we're located because um, if PATH needs to do stuff like that, we're, we're nice and close by and um, we're happy to help them out with that. I was there for that. That was really fun to watch. It was. It was really neat and they had fun. They had a really good time and I'm sure they'll come back and do it again with us. Um, can go to the next slide. So the um, last year they kind of changed how they do membership. Um, 
and those are the current costs. Um, the one would they used to have just really one. They had lifetime, and then they had regular membership. And so um, the way they used to do it was you paid your dues, your membership dues, at the same time you got your research. You did your recertification, which is just a paper saying you've done your CEs and you know things like that as an instructor. But now they've separated membership from certification. And that's part of that process that I talked about with making it an outside of path certification. So now membership is separate for us. You don't have to, membership is now optional, essentially. It does not tie to our certification. And anybody can be a member. So if you're not a member and wanna be a member, most likely you do the participating membership. If you click on that link, um, it should take you to the membership and um, be able to show you what you get for your membership. I think Marilyn, you were asking kind of what does that look like? What do you get? Mm -hmm. And so if you look on that, it should show you, um, and then the, the corresponding memberships <clears throat> and have those things plus, you know, they kind of put that up on there. Um, there you go. So if you look at the bottom there, participating member, so that's right. the seventy dollar one. Those are all the things. Yes. Yeah. Yep. All the things you get with the membership. So um, you know, discount on virtual conferences, um, discount on international conference res registration. Um, cool. And you don't so have to be a part You don't have to be an instructor or anything to be just a participating no. member. Good. Nope. I don't think you even need to be an instructor for any of them. Okay. anymore. It's open to you. So if you go up, Emmy, um, you know, that's it for the professional one. Um, there's additional things that you get. Um, the things that you get, though, are more applicable to being an instructor. So certification applications, unless you're planning on being an instructor, you know, you know, why would you care about that? So right. I would think the regular one would be where I am. Sufficient, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, the professional one, free access to webinars and conference recordings, things like that. So that's, you know, that adds up if you do a lot of those webinars, mm -hmm. um, things like that. Um, they also have, and I didn't do a slide for it, but they have online courses that you can take. And um, if you're a PATH member, they have, you have a discount, but you don't have to be a PATH member to take them. Um, they have um, a courses on autism spectrum disorder. They have a webinar on, um, not webinar, sorry, these are courses that you take. They're anywhere from three to four weeks long. Um, it's an interactive, um, it's on Moodle, I think. Uh, so it's a, it's a class, you're taking a class with other people. Um, it's not Zoom, so you don't see people, but you know, you have assignments, you have a facilitator, um, you have other people throughout the world taking the course, then you have to interact with them, posts and things like that. They have trauma. They have um, a spinal cord injury. Um, they have Equine Services for Heroes, which is the veterans um, program. Um, so those are all uh, online courses that you can take. And again, you don't have to be an instructor to take them. So um, I'm teaching a mentoring class now. That one is for instructors, um, how to be a mentor to people that want to become instructors. Um, mm -hmm. So I teach that class and I teach the Equine Specialist for Hero or Services for Heroes uh, course and the um, Autism Spectrum Disorder course. Um, but those are um, offered as well. Um, so they're usually offered a couple times a, a year. And again, you can find those under education on the tab. Um, and if you're a participating member, I think you get a um, discount on those, membership discount on those um, courses. One. Any question about memberships or anything like that? Um, 
this is where um, I just put this on there in case anyone needed to, had to ask a question of that, um, them. Path. That's where they're located um, in Westminster. Um, oh, go back one. There we go. So we mentioned EGALA. So these are just other EAT organizations that you can kind of look up. So EGALA is um, mental health. Again, it's a ground-based curriculum. It's all over the world. It's um, based in Utah is their headquarters. Um, and it's interesting just to read about them. I'm interested in possibly doing a gala as well. There's a lot of PATH instructors that are multi um, certified. Um, it's a lot more expensive um, and it's similar to PATH. So like we kind of were talking about before, um, you have to have a mental health provider and an ES when you're working with clients. Um, Strides to Success, um, they offer courses and things like that. They are a PATH organization, um, but they focus on equine facilitated learning and a lot more on the education, so with kids and things like that. So that's a really um, neat organization. Um, then E3A, they're um, more on the, EF, still EFL, but um, professional development, team building, um, working with corporations, those type things, that's their, their forte. Um, so, um, I have friends that work for all of them, all of those organizations, um, and, um, they're all great and they all do a little bit different things. So it's kind of neat to, um, even though we're talking about PATH, um, look at other outside of PATH, you know, what other things are out there. Excuse me, will we have access to these? Uh, web yes, link. Emmy's going to, Emmy will send you those um, via, I guess, email, Emmy. I don't know how you're going to send those out. So you can click on those links and, um, yeah, peruse at your leisure. You. Yeah, this is our requisite question slide. He just mm -hmm. had a look on his face. I love this fuzzy face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So any well, questions? I don't even remember. Do I have another slide? I don't even know. Um, I don't know, I, my, my slides finished at how to join. Um, you guys have any other, anything I didn't cover? Any questions about any things we did cover? Well, I was just wondering the awards that you all got, was that PATH? Oriented? Yes, so every year um, PATH has um, awards. So um, we usually submit um, and it goes to your region first. So what happens is the only ones that PATH selects outright are Equestrian of the Year and um, there are two, I think Youth Rider of the Year, something like that, adult or youth and then um, veteran. So when you apply, it goes to usually your region um, and then the region picks winners. So we had a couple of region winners this year, which were Liz as professional of the year, um, Varsity as equine of the year, and Carol as volunteer of the year. Then the winners of, for those categories, um, each winner for the region goes to PATH, and then PATH picks the PATH international winner of the year. So um, that was Carol. That's when awesome. um, volunteer of the year. So that's our second volunteer of the world of the year. I think Dave Culbertson won in 2016. Um, we had quite a few winners that year. We had, we had um, well, Mike suit was up for vet of the year. 81 um, something. Yeah. <laughs> um, so usually what happens is those winners that are announced at the at the um, conference, international conference, so that we they don't know who's won yet. So um, horse of the year, volunteer of the year, veteran of the year, veterinarian of the year, you know, um, the region winners sometimes will go and then they'll announce the winner for PATH. So it's pretty exciting um, to, to, wow. to win those. And you get usually, a, yeah, they get a, Jacket, she'll get a ja they'll get a jacket. So oh, Carissa, Carissa won um, Equestrian of the Year in 2016. She's got a cool jacket. She wears it very proudly. Um, the car? What? I they get a car or something. A car? <laughs> like to drive? Yeah, a horse. No, I don't think so. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, so we usually write up um, 
if you, we win, so in other words, for, for next year, we will not be eligible for a PATH um, Volunteer of the Year because we won this year. Um, so when you win a, or a category, you kind of have to sit out a year for that category, but the other categories we can apply. Um, and it's usually the staff kind of gets together. I mean, Emmy will, you know, look at stuff and nominate and, you know, and Liz and, you know, we'll put together what horse we want to put out there and then, you know, that type thing. So we usually always nominate someone we've, um, I think every year we nominate for at least most, if not all of the categories. Yeah, so it's fun. It's good recognition. Any other questions about anything? Michelle, I know one of the things that we at Hearts and Horses are pretty proud of is being not only an accredited center, but a premier accredited center. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you could kind of just say what that means to be an accredited center. Sure. Level. So there's different center um, memberships too. So you can be a member center, which means that you have um, instructors who are PATH certified, but your center is not. So let's say um, you're at a boarding stable, a regular boarding stable, and um, you teach classes as a, as a PATH instructor, then you're a PATH member center, which means me as an instructor have to abide by PATH standards, but the center does not because they're not a accredited center. They're not. Um, but a premier accredited center, which we are, which is a PAC, um, has to go through every five years, essentially, and they call it a recertification, but it's an inspection. <laughs> you have people, a person come out that is a site, um, um, a faculty that comes out to your site, and um, we have a book of standards that PATH, our PATH puts out of PATH standards, and they make sure from everything from our paperwork to our horse care, to our facilities, to the quality of teaching are following PATH standards. They go through every single standard and you have to address every standard. And if you don't pass, then you you have time to fix it. But if you don't, then they take our, our accreditation away. So it's a really high standard. We did it in 2018 was our last um, certification. We came away with perfect um, score. Um, it's a lot of work, obviously getting ready for it, but if we, you know, keep the standards up, it's not that difficult. It's just more of a paper drill. Um, so if you find a center that is a PATH accredited center, you know that a lot of work went into it to make it a safe place for people to be riding and that their horses should be cared for at a certain level of, um, of care and that the, the instructors are you know, all certified as PATH instructors. So. Like the other facilities around here that. Oh, you went away, Shannon. Your voice. You weren't, you're not muted, but your voice went away. Can't hear you. I know. <laughs> that work? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. I just muted. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Raise that button. <laughs> um, so the other centers around here that we hear about, most of them are not premier, right? Like the places where. You went away again. No, um, CSU has a, um, a small organization called um, Free Front Range Exceptional Equestrians. They've been around, they run out of the CSU uh, Equine Center. They are a PATH accredited center, a premier center. Um, and then there's us, really. I don't know of any other PATH centers near us that are PATH accredited center, or premier accredited centers. Yeah, it's, um, it's a lot of work. And um, so the other barns that you might see or where they're doing therapeutic riding, they may not be PATH centers. I would yeah. think it'd be a real benefit, though, in the long run, like to get grants and scholarships and, you know, we probably it is. It's hard. hard on that, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and think about where if you if you know path and you have a, 
a child or something like that that you want to take to a place, you want to know that they're they know what they're doing and that they're right. following some level of standards. Yeah. Right. They're they're not not that there there are a lot of fly by night backyard places that do things and um, not to say that they're doing things wrong, um, but there's a, a a level of overwatch that yeah. that's what PATH provides kind of that umbrella to give us they don't um, dictate you know how we teach or things like that but that's that overwatch of standards that we are responsible for um, upholding. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, is and that pretty well known in the industry? People know hearts and horses. So, um, I have a question. Can you hear me, Michelle? I can. Hurry, talk fast. Okay, I'm not going to move a muscle. Um, <laughs> uh, so I've had a few people that I've met who um, wanted to send their child here, and I'm wondering how backed up is our wait list right now? Like, are we accepting anyone new, or are we backed up because of COVID and everything? Yeah, so um, one of the standards that we um, have to adhere to is horse usage. So the horses it is actual standard. Horses are only allowed to work so much and many hours per day and only so many per week. So we that is our cap. So whatever those numbers equal, that's how many rides that they're allowed to do. Um, we we actually try to do a little less than what that standard is. We don't ever exceed it, but we try to, to give the horse comfort because it is pretty high. I want to say it's about 10 rides a week. Now, anyone that has a horse, how many of you ride your horse 10 times a week, right? Think about that. It's a lot of work. Um, so that is where we, we're capped. So right now, I think we're at 20, I mean, you can help me out here, 20 something horses. Um, we don't count Hope and Gracie right now because they're not in classes. Um, it's funny because I guessed it was that because I knew it was like two per day and they always have Sunday off. So I figured it was around 10 a week was probably the limit. And I always yeah. joking with the horses going, oh, you only have to work two hours a day. It's not that big of a deal. But when you put it like, how often do you ride your own horse? I mean, I don't have one, but obviously most people don't ride twice a day every single day. So I guess that does yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and um, so that is our cap. So to answer your question, so we, if you look at that, you know, it's maybe 132 rides um, is what we can offer. And then you got to look at our horses too. Zelly cannot handle the same load as Rocket, right? I can't put the same type of riders on those horses. So you kind of have to look at all that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, you know, what, what classes are we looking at? CL has a bigger wait list than maybe TR. I don't know. My veterans right now, I'm even. like, So it just depends what type of uh, class they want. I'm pretty sure TS is full. They always have a wait list. Um, so yeah, it just kind of depends what they're looking for, what class and things like that. The best thing, the advice I would offer is to get them in the queue. And by that is come in, get a meet and greet, um, get the paperwork in, and then then they're in there active. If they wait for the wait list not to be there, that's not going to happen. Um, Emmy, I told them to call the front desk, but I know a lot of times there's volunteers, and I know that they're trained, but do, you, do the volunteers know, like, where to send people who want to get their kids on the list for riding, like, for evaluation and all that? Yeah, so the, typically if we get a call in and a volunteer takes it for a participant intake, they'll send it to Kelly or Lauren and they'll answer those okay. questions. Okay, cool. Lauren and Kelly generally set up the meet and greets. Um, Tamara for changing leads um, and I do veterans. So the TSTR should be Lauren and um, Kelly. Um, changing leads is usually um, probably Rachel too and Tamara um, and then veterans come to me. So that's kind of the, how, the, how we break things down. And they've said, one person said they had an issue with cost because like Medicare isn't accepted. And I said, but we have scholarships. So look into right. that. Yes. So they when during their meet and greet, they can mention that and they'll be given a scholarship application um, either online or in, you know, whatever's easy for them. And um, scholarships usually are, are based on need. Um, we usually don't give 100% scholarship. We ask, we, you know, a little bit of investment. It could be as little as $10, you know, but we found that if there's a little bit of investment, um, it tends to help with attendance and things like that. Um, 
Makes sense. But yeah, it's based on, you know, what their, what their income is, what their availability is, because we don't ever want someone not to ride because of the cost. Mm -hmm. um, so. And if we wanted to get into like providing scholarships and stuff like that, is that like a Jan thing or a Tamara thing? You mean providing money? Like, yeah, like donating to scholarships specifically. Um, you can, um, all of our donations, so you can donate to general, you can donate to specific. Um, we have had writers, for example, a CL writer who has a sponsor. Yeah. Um, it's an anonymous sponsor for her and um, she pays for her lessons. Um, she's been doing that for years. So you can be that specific. Same with horses, you can sponsor a horse. You can say, I want, you know, um, money to go to a horse or you want, or if you do a donation, say, I want to go to this, I want this money to go toward horse care, or I want this money to go to the veterans program because those guys do not pay. They're um, always veterans are free. Um, I want my money to go to um, a TR rider. So you can specify your donation or you can just say, hey, Hearts and Horses, you put this money where you need it. You know, that type. Like of thing. here's so to can... paying back the Lucky Hearts Arena loans. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Because last yeah. time I talked to, to Jan, she was like, I think we had like 30 grand left or something. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you can be very specific or very general with your donation. Yep. And okay. however you want to do it. Um, but yeah, if you want, if you had someone in mind that you said, you know, I really want to sponsor this writer, um, you can get with you probably with Jan. I don't know who's doing fiscal right now, but um, and or Tam or um, Tamara or Lauren, and just say, you know, I want to make this happen, and, and they'll they'll work that with you. Yeah, yeah we've had a couple. A can I ask a question to Emmy? Yes. So Emmy, with this um, gala, how is that going to work? online I, I have a hard time picturing so i'm not all up on all the exact details because oh okay. there's no volunteers i'm not really involved in the gala this year oh, okay. but we're gonna have so we're gonna have a live stream so we have um we have some pre-recorded video some live video so it's going to be okay. basically like like a tv show so to speak where we'll have an mc we'll have events going on They'll be talking about what we do, showing videos about what we do. You probably saw Tamara running around like a maniac a couple weeks ago, getting all sorts of stuff filmed. Um, yeah. So that'll be the main, like the event itself in terms of the presentation. But then we'll still have um, live auction, silent auction, all of those pieces, but they'll be online. So there'll be a platform that you log into to see all the items, put in your bids and kind of monitor it during the evening. Do we need to sign up now for that? Um, do you know, or I'm not sure. I know, I know the show itself is free, so there's not a ticket price for this year. Okay. Um, but I'm not sure if you have to pre-register or not. That would be, if you go to the website, there should be links for it. If there is, there's a, a, yeah, there's a link. And, um, there's also at the front desk, I noticed some paper copies of something about the gala. I don't know what that was, if that was, that, that was silent auction donation. For okay. Us, so. Yeah. And we have a really big concert happening yeah, so that'll be cool. that sounds I, I watched the preview it looks really fun I'm very excited yeah. I'm sure you guys Richard, are doing a good job auction items early what was that Marilyn can you see the silent auction items early before the I'm event I'm not sure I don't know on that one all right do you guys have any more questions for me I don't think so. You did a great job. Yes. You guys made the, oh, there we go. Oh, that was my last slide. <laughs> there you go. Okay. There we go. All right. <laughs> well, it, it is bid an auction, so it does start on the seventh. Seventh okay. to twelfth. Yep. Okay. Twelfth. Okay. And there's the web. There's the where you go to bid. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Yep. See, I did that. I, I put that in there. Is our by plug now. <laughs> Pretty smart little plug. <laughs> Emma will appreciate that, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, y'all, I miss you very much. And I'll see you soon.